Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CITP webinar. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Miranda Bogan, who is the founding director of the AI Governance Lab at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, Miranda has worked in AI policy and responsible AI for many years. Uh, she and has led work at the intersection of policy and an eye fairness and governance, both in industry and civil society. Uh, she served as a co-chair of the Fairness, Transparency, and Accountability Working Group at the Partnership on AI. Uh, she conducted foundational research at the intersection of machine learning and civil rights in Upturn. And most recently, she guided strategy and implementation of responsible AI practices at Meta. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you, Miranda, speak at the CITP virtually, and we're looking forward to hearing more about your work. Thank you so much, Alexandra, and uh, nice to see everyone on the webinar. Um, as was mentioned, I recently started a, an initiative at the Center for Democracy and Technology, which is a um, research think tank and advocacy group here in Washington, D.C., focused on uh, digital rights um, from, you know, privacy, free expression, all the way through to civil rights and equity. And we were really seeing a need for um, practical conversations around what uh, the next phase of AI policy and governance should look like um, and, and thinking about how to get concrete with some of the concepts that are so important in policy conversations, um, fairness and discrimination being one of them that I've worked on for a while. So I'm really excited to be here and uh, talk about some of the research that I've been involved in and some of the practical work um, where I saw um, that there remain a lot of open questions here. And I really hope uh, as a call to action um, to, to have folks uh, thinking about some of these questions or even potentially work with some of you on them. So I'll get started. <clears throat> so I think it's fair to say, <laughs> so to speak, that um, everyone has aligned around the idea that um, AI systems shouldn't be biased, they should be fair, they should be non-discriminatory. Um, that is showing up everywhere from uh, administration uh, articulations of, of AI priorities to um, administrative agencies to legislative proposals. Um, and, and that's important, but it, it has remained somewhat of an abstract level, although we are getting um, to more concreteness recently, which is really exciting. Um, some of the expectations around what to do uh, to prevent discrimination are beginning to take shape, but they, you know, they still have a lot of unanswered questions. So some of the things we've seen in recent years are, are concerns around the use of proxies as inputs into systems, um, looking at uh, adverse impact or disparate impact in outcomes of systems, um, and the exploration of less discriminatory alternatives to models that are being developed, which is grounded in um, existing systems civil rights law. Um, the blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights uh, that came out last year um, took another step in, in describing what the expectations were around how to address, um, once you measure uh, whether there are disparities in a system, how might you address them? So a lot of attention on representative data, um, but there hasn't yet been a, a ton of conversation around what sufficient representation of data might mean. Ideally, it would mean that data in used in AI training is representative enough that the system doesn't result in the disparities we're concerned about. But we've also seen uh, interpretations of this to mean equally representative data across groups um, that are in an underlying population, which may or may not actually lead to that desired outcome. Um, continued attention to proxies or demographic information directly in systems, um, but we, you know, many of us know that um, simply removing some of the more explicit data um, or proxies might not necessarily have the result of addressing outcome gaps, especially if there is correlation between um, demographic characteristics and underlying patterns in society, um, and are those underlying patterns themselves proxies or are, are those correlations and how do we kind of think about that? Um, evaluating multiple models and approaches, um, looking at the less, dis less 
discriminatory alternative uh, is one that's coming up quite a bit and some great research um, from some uh, wonderful old colleagues and, and, and great researchers on that topic recently. Um, however, uh, in practice, you often see that models are not standalone artifacts in, an, in, in the abstract, but are part of systems where there are maybe multiple different components that testing for and looking for alternatives within the models themselves might not necessarily have the desired impact on the outcomes of a more complex system. So how do we think about that? Um, and then higher higher order uh, imperatives of considering the purpose of the system itself and the target variables are also uh, ones that, that have been raised and are really important. Um, just this last uh, week or two, um, the Office of Management and Budget put out um, some additional guidance on what they expect uh, you know, government agencies to do, which, which are actually getting even more uh, concrete than, than we saw recently. So I had to update my presentation just a few days ago to reflect this. Um, but some new ideas here about making sure that AI systems uh, checking whether they material materially rely on information about protected classes in a way that could result in discrimination. So what does materiality in that case mean? Um, whether proxies produce undue influence, that's a question of causality, um, that uh, there is still research in, in looking at causal effects in AI systems. Um, disparities in performance of a system, which is a different concept than disparities in outcomes. Um, so something to, to look at there. And then again, adequate representation of data sets uh, and whether there's impro improper bias in that data, but what is improper bias when um, sometimes this data is reflective of patterns in society um, and what steps are expected to be taken if you find that bias. And so, you know, my experience the last few years working with teams who were developing methods to um, measure potential bias and discrimination in systems, um, especially systems that are more complex than uh, sort of containable models that that kind of make sense when you write them down. Um, some concrete questions came up, uh, particularly around how to mitigate gaps that were identified. So for example, do some of the methods that have been developed by the research community to um, either adversarially retrain models or recalibrate models um, in relation to demographic groups, it, it, is that one of those upstream mitigations, like addressing um, bias in data sets or structurally changing models? Or at the level of the technical intervention, does that actually more closely resemble um, having demographic characteristics touch a decision? And is that acceptable? Um, it could be that it is, but it also you know, can be interpreted by, uh, by folks or, or specifically by legal um, folks who are, are tasked with, with looking at the legal constraints. Uh, does that constitute you know, unfair inclusion of those demographic characteristics or pro proxies, um, and how do we navigate that that understanding? Um, does the use of democratic characteristics in an upstream phase of model development, like sourcing of data automatically, um, or uh, sourcing uh, content in a ranking model, um, but not using the demographic characteristics to rank the content, um, does that constitute a discriminatory decision of how to how to how to choose uh, data that will be that will be considered in a specific decision or is that a, a credible step to ensuring a more representative system um, I would argue it's the latter but I, it's important to be aware that that there's some ambiguity in um, how people think they can use uh, demographic data to intervene in systems at all so something that that I found really interesting when, if ever, is it appropriate to apply an intervention or a mitigation in a model system based on an inferred characteristic? There's often an assumption in practice, even for measurement, let alone mitigating um, disparities, that this data exists and is accessible in the first place, which is um, tends actually not to be true. But even if uh, if if steps have been taken to measure using an, an imputed characteristic, an inferred characteristic, um, is that same approach, uh, uh, the right thing to do to actually intervene, um, whether upstream and sort of model development or downstream and some kind of um, 
modification of how a system is is operating. And of course, the question of what proxies actually are, especially when we're dealing with unlabeled uh, models and data sets that rely more on clustering or or pattern detection, but not naming uh, groups or or categories. How do we think about what proxies uh, ought to mean? Um, so a way that I I stepped back and and tried to think about um, given all these open questions and and what I was uh, seeing from practitioners and in, in their um, desire for interventions, confusion about how to do this, or constraints that they might be facing, um, looking at the uh, overall um, idea that we're talking generally about funnels or sort of the, the notion that they're upstream parts of processes and then they move toward um, a more concrete decision or, or more concrete action. So this is the case in the allocation of opportunity more generally. And so this graphic is from some research I did looking at um, the concept of AI and hiring, which is that hiring is not a binary decision. There ultimately is a decision about whether to hire someone or not, but there are actually many steps that go into whether someone's considered for that in the first place. Um, and the the top of the funnel is actually a really important part of, of that uh, uh, to consider. That's the same in machine learning um, and in AI. Um, you have the upstream part of the process. Uh, let's uh, take, for example, a ranking system. This is not even about the design of the system, but the, the ranking system itself has an upstream component of sourcing content that could be ranked to an initial ranking of that content to potentially more specific uh, filtering rules to uh, enforce uh, you know, community standards or guidelines or something um, to soft actions around um, upranking or downranking content uh, based on a variety of, of uh, desirable uh, uh, characteristics of a, sy a system, all of which result in the final, final ranking of content that people experience. And so if you're thinking about fairness in a ranking system, um, there could be implications of that at every phase of, of that funnel. And now, so I, I did sort of a, a review of every um, approach to mitigating gaps, um, largely outcome gaps in algorithmic systems, but also performance gaps, and um, tried to map them against how they were being characterized as to their um, uh, likely um, their likely acceptability, or when they were being characterized as uh, either being unlikely to be acceptable or might relate um, an analogously to uh, to steps that are currently seen as um, disallowed, for example, direct intervention based on uh, protected characteristics. And it seemed to, to map in a similar way um, that the more desirable sort of more uh, more more focused on types of mitigations were largely upstream in the process of developing AI systems. And as you got further on down to uh, a system's decisions or actions itself, it was likely to be more problematic to intervene directly in order to um, affect the outcomes of that system. But at the same time, the systems themselves are not only making specific decisions that might implicate the law. Um, for example, when it when it comes to uh, um, economic opportunity or or protected characteristics, where there's a specific constraint on using protected characteristics to make that decision. There are also upstream systems like uh, job searches, for instance, in the job context um, that affect how people might end up finding those opportunities. And so I tried to map the upstreamness of different types of systems to the upstream and downstreamness of different types of mitigations to see where the heat map, uh, you know, my informal heat map played out. And it seemed like in any case, upstream mitigations are, you know, most uh, likely to be least problematic in, in most cases, but perhaps some of the downstream interventions of more actively intervening in systems uh, with an awareness of protected characteristics um, might be more acceptable in upstream systems that were not making explicit decisions about um, economic opportunity or other relevant factors. And so the reason that, you know, that, uh, this occurred that this kind of that I observed this I, I or not the reason but like some indicators of this playing out for instance uh were 
some steps taken, for example, by LinkedIn, which is that they um, explicitly have intervened in their um, in their candidate search tool for recruiters to re-rank candidates in in the results pages by gender. Um, and they they released that a few years ago, and no one seemed to be uh, overly concerned with that. And my hypothesis is that that is uh, analogous to things like the Rooney Rule, um, where it's acceptable to kind of um, be aware of the composition of the pool of eligible folks um, for a job, as long as you don't take those characteristics into account at the actual point of decision. Um, so you also see that play out. So you see if, if it's a downstream, uh, it's a tool that is downstream in a, um, an algorithmic decision that are, in that it is making a decision about a person in a way that affects their rights. Um, it is likely to be more challenging to also deploy downstream mitigations to gaps. Um, and how and and the interesting observation was that is very that was that was somewhat of an alien concept to uh, practitioners to to programmers who, uh, when shown a problem that there was a gap in a system, um, were asking, "What do we do to fix that gap?" And when told they couldn't fix it directly, um, often were somewhat confused about why that was and didn't understand what they could do further upstream to uh, to make to to address the the issue. And I think the literature around mitigating al algorithmic bias has some role to play in this, which is that a lot of the recommendations have been around technical toolkits and interventions to plug into systems that. Um, that end up closer to that downstream uh, intervention than we might than we might think when we're thinking theoretically. Um, and again, some of this is all still very abstract. And so when you say it seems like generally acceptable uh, and desirable to increase the representativity of training data, there's actually many ways to do that, some of which might be more or less desirable um, in practice uh, or more or less feasible in practice. So there are many ways to increase representativity of training data one could be collecting more data, which might have privacy implications, and how do we think about that? One might be to specifically collect more data from underserved populations. That was a, um, a an action that was taken, I, I believe, by you know Google did this to increase the improve the performance of um, facial detection algorithms on uh, on with with uh, faces of color. But that then you know. Could be seen as sort of an exploitative uh, extraction of data from that community. So you probably don't want to encourage that without some additional um, uh, nuance. Um, you could also stratify sampling um, or upsample data from underserved communities, but at a functional layer, you know, in practice, when you're dealing with data architecture, what that might end up requiring is that you now have metadata about data uh, about these protected characteristics. And how do you make sure that that metadata that allows for upsampling from underserved populations doesn't end up being used elsewhere in systems? It might require changing training weights of samples, which again, like, is a somewhat direct intervention in the training process um, uh, of how data is interpreted in model training. Um, but if that's sort of upstream in the machine learning development process, maybe that's a acceptable point of intervention that more explicitly uses those characteristics and so on. Um, so this is the level of, of, uh, of exploration and, and challenge that practitioners are facing when trying to operationalize the um, imperative to m measure and mitigate bias in systems. So the you know how do we think about this? You know what mitigations will ultimately be ex expected, and which of them will be accepted, and which might be challenged that we should prepare for. Um, the way I think about it is in terms of analogies. Um, so you know the less discriminatory alternative. And I wrote this slide before. Uh, I know some of the folks on I think on the webinar uh, wrote a paper recently on this. But the less discriminatory alternative concept from the law is very similar to leveraging the phenomenon of, of model multiplicity to seek. Um, alternative uh, candidate models and launch the one that has the least uh, um, disparate impact on the on the other side. Inclusive recruitment practices are well uh, established and generally accepted that you can be mindful in where you source candidates from. Um, in practice, in a machine learning system, um, and I'll talk about this a bit in a few minutes, um, you might explore, as we did, a uh, reinforcement learning powered uh, system to iteratively measure how a system is uh, 
landing on outcomes and uh, and then adjusting at a high level the strategy of how that um, of how that uh, system is ranking content, for example, and and measuring again over time to see if that strategy uh, had the desired impact, but without intervening directly um, on uh, based on a protected characteristics. Um, you might think of the Rooney Rule again of of you know who is included in the option set that people uh, have to consider whether to take an action as like a the proportional re-ranking uh, um, approach that LinkedIn took um, or in, or uh, using demographic characteristics to inform the initial ranking of a system but then have the remaining steps not take that into account so that the ultimate ranking of a system um, doesn't explicitly rely on that but that everyone had a sufficiently um, sufficient had a sufficient opportunity to be ranked in a system for example um holistic university admission is another one i'm you know tracking closely especially with the supreme court case um you know, to what extent is it acceptable to allow a protected class to be considered as a feature as long as it is not the uh, determinative feature? And we saw this in the OMB guidance as this, 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 uh, this data or these proxies shouldn't have an undue influence on the outcome. Does that mean that they can be in, allowed and can, it can be part of the training data in the first place? Sometimes that actually leads to fairer outcomes if um, if the protected class data actually is a meaningful differentiator um, uh, in what the intervention should be. This is the case in some healthcare contexts where you would want to know if, uh, um, if, if someone is a man or a woman when you're screening for uh, breast cancer, for instance, indicators might be extremely different. Um, but in, in, in other cases, that might not be acceptable. Um, and and uh, direct boosts of content uh, or direct changes of decisions at the outset might, might be more akin to like an affirmative action-based approach. But thinking about the analogies and how, how other people will analogize the interventions that are being made and how that might relate to whether they're ultimately um, seen as a, as a positive uh, and, and um, acceptable approach to mitigating algorithmic bias or whether they end up being challenged as a practice. And so a sidebar I want to talk about for a moment is, is again, that Nearly all of these mitigations, apart from those extremely upstream approaches uh, of rethinking the system in the first place, um, require the ability to measure whether those systems uh, are, are leading to some kind of demographic bias at all. Um, some work I did a number of years ago, um, we looked at the extent to which uh, this is a challenge, um, but we also looked at uh, other industries that have grappled with this same challenge in the first place and have and have determined um, largely that if we want to address discrimination, we we need to acknowledge that that data is necessary. Um, that's not the case in all circumstances. For example, in consumer credit, um, the developers are not allowed to um, to uh, uh, co directly collect that data in order to test those models, and so they've been uh, pushed into methods for imputing um, that data in 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 you know carved out circumstances. Um, but if we want this practice to be kind of widely adopted of, of proactively addressing, uh, measuring and mitigating discrimination, we need to grapple with the fact that this is still a somewhat unanswered question. Um, even if collection is uh, acceptable and, and sort of um, a general practice and desired, response rates to collection approaches tend not to result in sufficient data to enable measurement and also result in selection biases. And so when is inference or imputation um, a an acceptable or desirable approach to enable measurement. Um, some some research uh, also demonstrated that while the while imputation may be imperfect, um, it does help directionally understand uh, whether there might be issues and whether interventions um, might improve the status quo. So, you know, how do we think about that? How do we how do we um, put like stack that against concerns around privacy and concerns around whether imputations or inference might be misused? What sort of architecture um, and data practices would we expect if imputation was uh, being leveraged to make sure that it was only being used for measurement at the same time if it was if it's only if it's so constrained so it's only being able to use for measurement and not some of those upstream but more direct interventions then we're also at an impasse of of what sort of uh, interventions might end up being possible um, to actually address the gaps that are identified as part of those measurements um 
And, you know, there might be room for innovation here thinking. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about the work that uh, happened while I was at Meta, where, you know, we there was uh, pressure to measure and mitigate bias in, in the advertising system. Um, and there was a need to have data to enable that measurement, which was not data that was readily available. Um, at the same time, you know, collection of that data wasn't going to result, direct collection wasn't going to result in enough data to measure in real time the system in question. And so we explored imputation methods, but adding additional um, privacy enhancements, um, such as differential privacy and real-time aggregation to kind of address some of that privacy and fairness trade-off while still being able to measure um, in aggregate, whether there were disparities, but not have that result in the creation of new um, sensitive demographic information about people. Um, and again, so how should how should interventions or mitigations change depending on the characteristics of this data? So if we're talking about the, um, for example, very upstream and pretty widely accepted approach of ensuring more um, inclusion, uh, more representation in data sets. Um, it's like, you know, we might think about this if, if we if we are dealing with self-provided data um, about the um, relevant characteristics that we want to be inclusive over versus um, inferred data that can have different impacts. Um, if we're talking about sort of downstream ranking, some really interesting research on if you're if you're if you're intervening based on inferred characteristic that might actually uh, have some counterproductive uh, uh, circumstances. Um, there was critique when the government used an imputation method to um, to uh, inform direct remedies uh, to to um, bias that, that that they observed. Um, at the same time, inferences are useful at, in some circumstances. And so how how do we navigate this? When when should certain approaches be used just for measurement versus when might they be acceptable to use for intervention? And at what stage in that um, in that pipeline, in that funnel of uh, of AI development? And again, so sometimes the expectations uh, and the practical constraints that that practitioners are facing, um, you know, aren't really speaking to each other and aren't necessarily fully worked out or aligned, but there is an expectation of action nonetheless. And so I want to talk about um, a, a little bit of the work uh, that that my the teams I worked with did at Meta to try and move forward through this uh, complexity. Um, you know, I, I think in in a way that was thoughtful, um, I think there are still plenty of work to be done both there and everywhere else to, to figure out how to address these things. But just to, sh to talk through some of the shape of uh, what this can look like in practice. So um, the, you know, and some research that I was involved in, uh, bef you know, before I joined the company uh, and, and Professor Kor Korolova as well, um, you know, we looked at whether there was, there were disparities in how ads uh, for housing employment, housing and employment at the time, but also thinking about credit as part of that bucket might be distributed unevenly across populations. Um, which led to a lot of interest in, in you know, uh, both putting pressure on the company to to change that and then to push for those changes. Um, you know, the, De the Department of Housing and Urban Development brought a charge of discrimination against the company. Um, and so that sort of incentivized the need to address the gap. Um, but it faced a couple of challenges, the sort of next steps, which were first um, the research, you know, that that we did uh, from the outside, we used voter record data um, to measure the racial disparities specifically. Um, and, you know, that that data was not necessarily data that the the you, you might want a company to just sort of onboard for for their own purposes or, or for this measurement. So um, and it was relatively limited data to only certain certain states. And so the the barrier first, the sort of first hurdle of access to demographic data um, was something that we had to uh, kind of work through. And then, um, you know, even once we uh, figured out sort of a path to being able to measure in aggregate the, the demographic um, array of sort of how ads are being delivered, um, 
and a system like that is like highly complex with many different components. And so the sort of uh, approach of looking at different options of different models um, uh, or rethinking the whole system uh, in general was, you know, were constraints that we were navigating. Um, and so the intervention had to, if we wanted to address the disparities on the like coming out the other end had to be further toward that downstream part of the system. And yet, because this was an area that uh, that implicated sort of the civil rights concerns, the use of demographic data in the intervention was also constrained. So, you know, what we ultimately did was um, looked again back at those analogies and said, um, how does this work in other contexts and took inspiration from the, the domain of uh, inclusive uh, recruitment around employment or, or um, education, where it's expected to, again, as I said, sort of um, look at the strategy for how um, you're trying to accomplish the goal, um, measure periodically how you're doing on that. And if, if your measurements are determining that there is an issue you need to address to revisit the strategy and make adjustments. And so what we ended up building was um, a, a system that sort of sat towards the end of the ad delivery system that measured in snapshots over time the distribution of a given ad by demographic using that privacy preserving um, demographic measurement approach that I mentioned. And if there was a disparity observed against the audience who was eligible to see an ad, um, the the system was notified um, just with a, a basically a distance metric. Um, and and was uh, the reinforcement learning model was fed by whether the distance distance metric was expanding or um, or reducing um, and changing the overall uh, uh, strategy for delivering ads with the goal of reducing those disparities uh, at the out like down the line and so trying to thread that needle between needing to uh, you know having the 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 being incentivized and and sort of pushed to um, address disparities um, in a particular system, but also not being able to directly intervene um, based on the characteristics uh, for which those disparities were observed and did that by doing this sort of iterative measurement based and adjustment approach. Um, and so in practice, kind of trying to thread that needle between wanting to intervene in a more um, abstracted sense, um, but also needing to do that in a downstream setting um, and circumstance. So it's sort of a, an interesting case study in what this looks like in practice and why we need some more thinking um, in the area of mitigation against expectations around how we mitigate the, the practical constraints around how to even measure, let alone know if a mitigation has been effective, which you need to measure kind of over time. Um, and, and kind of put those pieces together in a way that's actionable for folks who are building the systems that we are all hoping that they proactively uh, measure and mitigate bias for. Um, a couple of questions that that came up in in throughout the course of that work that I want to kind of share and hopefully people will uh, will take up and and I'm hopeful that I can take them up as well perhaps together with you is um, what do we do when the measurement challenges there because uh, demographic data doesn't exist when it could or when we're dealing with um, more nuanced uh, questions of of demographics or bias for example thinking about religion disability. Um, other protected characteristics that we don't have existing methods to do imputations for and we haven't aligned um, or, or kind of come to consensus on whether that's the right balance between um, addressing discrimination and protecting privacy. How do we um, address that really universal goal of more inclusive data in these systems when again, that data, the, the metadata about data doesn't often exist um, and the incentives that, that are are created by demanding more inclusive data can lead to some of those practices that um, also have uh, have their own implications, like going out and collecting more data or labeling data in certain ways. Like, how do we provide more actionable guidance for what it actually looks like to um, build inclusive data responsibly? Um, how do we address bias in multi-component systems, complex systems? Um, some work demonstrating that just because you fix uh, biases in a, a component of a system does not guarantee that the overall system will reflect those those fixes. Um, many upper many many um, 
enterprise and operational systems are different components of them are, are changed at different paces and by different teams. And so how do you make sure that any um, steps you've taken to address gaps hold as the system changes underneath you. And that's why sometimes a downstream intervention might end up being the only way to um, address uh, address outcome disparities. But how do we um, think about that? Uh, and, and how do we enable that type of intervention, especially when we, didn't, we don't want um, certain protected characteristics to be used at decision time, um, but upstream interventions are, are less possible. Um, how do we think about the less discriminatory alternative approach um, in a broad system like that, where you can't necessarily compare different versions of an overall uh, system? Um, how do we incorporate that? Um, how, how do we also think about um, multi, uh, multi-platform or over time issues of bias and discrimination. Again, solving, um, a problem in one part of a, of a funnel when there are many actors throughout a funnel of actually accessing, um, a, an economic opportunity or, or some kind of other benefit relies on a lot of actors. So addressing, um, addressing biases at one, at one part might not solve for the whole thing and in fact might end up le leading to counterintuitive effects over time. Um, how do we think about uh, mitigating mitigating biases when there's increased uh, scrutiny over um, over uh, the, the types of interventions that have been more traditionally acceptable as we think about some of these affirmative action cases and now there's concerns around, now there's complaints against approaches that use proxies um, as uh, as signals for, for how to make these decisions. How do we make sure that practitioners when they're trying to mitigate against biases don't fall into a trap of defining their mitigation in terms that might trigger scrut undue scrutiny that we actually want them to be effectuating but that might be, you know, misframed and therefore challenged by people uh, who are trying to erode the types of approaches that we have taken to advance equity in society before. And then how do we get engineers who are more practically oriented and when they see uh, when they're told about a problem or a gap or a bug, they are inclined to figure out the most direct way to fix that, but that is not aligned with how the you know policy conversation around bias and fairness is oriented. Um, the the policy and the legal orientation is that if you see a disparity or a problem, that you fix it further upstream, that you look at it systemically, um, and that you use the um, the system itself and the data that you're seeing as a countermetric and a signal about whether your interventions have been successful, but that you don't directly intervene um, at risk of uh, you know violating uh, other components of the law. How do we broaden perspective of this and how do we make that feel more actionable? Um, in general, so, so recapping the technical solutions, the bias mitigation techniques and libraries and um, approaches are not necessarily enough. Um, we need to think about what this looks like concretely um, and, and where these might be interpreted differently, um, where the constraints, the practical constraints might exist and, and start to figure out recommendations to solve those so that we can make this all more actionable um, for the people who are who, are, who, who we're all asking to do this work more, uh, more proactively. Um, and we need to be careful of how we end up characterizing these interventions so that they don't end up being misinterpreted um, and uh, and ultimately uh, um, advise that 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 people are ultimately advised against doing something that they ought to do. Um, how do we make sure to safeguard the the field of mitigations that can effectively address um, bias in AI systems, um, so that they uh, that we can actually move toward the world that we're all trying to advance? I hope on this call, and I'll stop there and take some questions. I think there's some in the Q and A. Um, is there an emerging consensus on what a product development process might have to produce as evidence that reasonable effort has been made to reduce bias at different stages of the development, and could that be incorporated? Um, I think that uh, that is something that the um, less discriminatory algorithms paper discusses a little bit. Um, but I think that that level of detail is exactly what we need to do of like, what are the practices that are reasonable to take and how can we articulate them so that we can start holding people accountable to taking those steps so they can't sort of um, uh, 
make a claim that this is such an undefined space that they don't know what to do, um, but rather that there are specific uh, efforts that um, can be deployed um, and and then we can assess whether they were effective or not. And if the if they weren't effective and a system was deployed, nonetheless, um, have something to judge against. I think that's a, an open area uh, of work that needs, needs to be done and actually something that at the AI Governance Lab at CDT, um, we want to start um, trying to articulate informed by this experience, both uh, from the research side and from the practical side. Um, and then uh, I've got another one from noticing that some of the larger problems that develop in algorithmic bias have less to do with the technology and more to do with the choices that people make um, upstream. How can lay people who are not technologists, researchers, or policymakers situated with this knowledge inform the discussions to understand um, what needs to be mitigated? I think that's such an important question because often um, you know, the 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 developing teams who are asking questions of how do I measure or mitigate bias? Here's the here's the system I've already built. Um, the question is so much more fundamental than that, and you and you want to inter you want to engage at the well. Why did you define a system like this? How did you set the um, the uh, objective function? What data did you decide to use, and was that appropriate? Um, those those conversations tend to be much more, um, they are moved through within a product team, you know, with engineers, potentially with product managers, sometimes informed by user research, but not often with the sort of more cross-functional team that might end up getting involved later on in, in a conversation. Um, and so those folks who actually do have the some some domain knowledge um, or, or some uh, sense of questions you could ask at that point are, are constrained in their own solution space um, and end up getting asked questions like how do we make sure that data the data is sufficiently representative um, as an intervention which is less satisfying and probably less effective than thinking about that upstream but nonetheless there are products that are being built and that are out, maybe already out in the world or are released that some of these more technical questions do come up and have to be answered. But ideally, we'd be thinking about this much more earlier on. So I think that's a plug from me for not over-rotating on, on STEM, um, not, uh, not kind of um, conceding to an engineering first kind of mindset in developing AI systems and products, but making sure that um, there's sufficient interdisciplinarity that goes into the development of these systems. Um, and that there's enough time for teams uh, to actually think through the implications of what they're building, because so often um, the work in practice is defined by launch timelines and roadmaps, and, and those happen even further upstream in the product development process. Um, and once they're kind of set, are difficult to untangle, and you need an external incentive to make sure that enough attention is being paid to these issues, such as uh, legal challenge or something like that. I think there's some chats as well, so I'm going to take a look. So someone asked about how can we practically reduce bias through process and demonstrate that through auditable evidence. Um, there's a lot that can be done through basic documentation of decision making, um, you know, making sure there is time to be explicit in what decisions are being made about data about uh, about goals of a system, about um, what the key metric of a system is, because so often that metric is what ends up informing whether uh, whether a product ends up getting launched. So two two practices that I observed being somewhat useful in that context, although certainly incomplete, are that the launch metric at minimum should be disaggregated across communities to make sure that um, there's not overconfidence that a system works well when it actually doesn't work well for many people. Um, the second approach would be thinking about given a metric that makes sense from like a business perspective or a product perspective or whatever is being built, what are counter metrics that we should be defining and tracking to make sure that we're not, again, overconfident in the possibility or success of a given system because this metric looks good, but we don't realize that there are these other impacts happening. And sometimes even the act of defining that can help identify where there are potential um, uh, risks. Um, but in actually operationalizing some of those questions, it can help make more clear 
the the weak points that a product might already be experiencing. And I'll be honest, um, there you know while there is a lot of fascinating academic discourse around how do you deal with competing fairness metrics, especially when there are underlying sort of base rates that you have to consider. Um, and people are really interested in discussing those, but so often many of the problems are around basic machine learning best practices and hygiene of, are you being thoughtful about what you're building? Are you appropriately measuring the things that you're building? Um, are you doing some basic documentation? Um, and, and what do you, and, and um, have you, have you taken any step to make sure to understand where your data is coming from or that it's representative on in any sense of the word um, rather than not doing any of that? And if we can inculcate some of those basic practices in the product development process, it will leave more room to discuss the harder trade-offs, which are so important in really high stakes circumstances. Um, and clear out what issues are caused simply by poor development practices and, and, and errors and bugs, and where are there questions that are truly sort of fairness considerations, um, or, or at least machine learning um, fairness considerations. And at the same time, how do we broaden the notion of, of what is necessary to address these concerns? And sometimes that not only goes, like zooms out to how a product is defined or its goals, but where money is being invested and spent, like, are there people who are paid to be experts and to engage with communities who are going to be impacted by systems? Is sufficient uh, labeling uh, budget going to making sure that there is data from underserved communities, um, even if that is harder data to uh, to label or to collect? Um, especially if you need to take additional steps to make sure that data is being collected or labeled responsibly. That's an investment level question, a resource allocation question that also um, bears very heavily on whether systems that ultimately flow from how that money is invested end up impacting people. Um, the next question I see is interventions often involve a cost. For example, in the context of job ads, an advertiser may need to pay more to reach the same audience if deliver, delivery ensures a balanced audience. How do you think about cost sharing? Um, that is definitely a question that comes up when thinking about this and, and a call to not be overly focused on a particular metric or a particular platform because there are sort of broader effects to keep in mind. And so one concern one might have in a in a personalized system where any sort of reduction in like purely economic efficiency is, is playing out um, either by the addition of noise in general or by an intervention um, that uh, is intended to kind of correct for, for some of these issues is that might be the appropriate intervention in a particular context. But um, it could also be the case that if, if the advertisers or the people who are posting content see a reduction in in what they see to be their desired outcome, that they'll reduce their overall engagement or spending on a given platform, which actually reduces the overall opportunities that are shared in general or that are redirected to other platforms that haven't taken that intervention. And therefore, we're just dislocating the problem rather than actually addressing it. So again, thinking about um, how do we uh, think about the like landscape of, of issues and what we're trying to mitigate against and make sure there's um, incentives across the board um, that, you know, regulations are appropriately uh, uh, scoped so that they cover all of the relevant actors in a space um, so that that sort of market failure uh, can get addressed at a more fundamental level. Um, Alexandra, I see your question. How do we think about differences in data availability and companies' willingness to obtain it when data serves as a business objective versus a bias mitigation objective? Um, data brokers, um, yeah. So I think that um, the question of incentives is really important here and the question of difficulty is really important because many many of much of the work around sort of responsible AI development or or fairness is like intrinsically more nuanced and complex and sometimes difficult in the sense of you could it could very easily go wrong by trying to kind of do it too simply um you know that in trying to uh, in, uh, advance equity, for instance, on a platform, one could easily be incentivized to suddenly go out and collect a whole bunch more information um, um, or or sort of 
take a direct intervention that actually doesn't end up serving those purposes. And so there's sort of an impetus to be a little bit more deliberate in making sure that you're going about that in, in a, in a responsible way as well, um, that the intervention doesn't lead to problems down the line that you don't like in trying to measure, um, like obtain a, a way to measure demographics, demographic, um, characteristics or distribution in a given system don't inadvertently like have that that data leak into other systems where it shouldn't leak so it it takes like getting and using data is is generally like it's somewhat easy but also when things are so easy that's when they go wrong um and so how do we ease the way for people who are trying to do this work well while making it more difficult to use that data for things that they sh that people shouldn't use it for i think the the trend that you observed also there was a temporal element of there had been practices uh um uh, around obtaining uh data that that was used for ads in in the past but steps had been taken to to stop doing that and then there was still an impetus to actually conduct measurement in in this sort of next phase and there, you know, there was certainly a consideration of how do we make sure in trying to do the right thing and actually address biases here, we don't like slip back into practices that people had rightly, um, uh, had rightly critiqued. And so that's something to keep in mind as well. But also thinking about many of the practitioners and companies who might be doing some of the most concerning and worst things might not have um, the, the expertise internally to know how they ought to do this and might end up going about it in a way that's quite counterproductive or ends up um, uh, being somewhat harmful down the line. So how do we provide really actionable and specific recommendations and guidance for how they ought to do this? And so the blueprint for the AI Bill of Rights um, started going about this by um, articulating that data should be held in a separate infrastructure and only used for measurement which is really like a good step and a good concrete recommendation, but also does raise questions about if there is a mitigation and upstream mitigation that might end up um, needing to rely on that data somehow, um, how do you square that with it being available for measurement only? Um, if we all decide that purely measurement only is actually what's acceptable, like that's that's okay, but that's a, that's a different argument than saying we need more representative data um, because that, question alone requires some awareness of the distribution of data, um, which is not just a measurement problem, but also if you actually are asked to make sure that data is more representative, you need to uh, have a more, have a dialogue between those systems. And so some sort of interface between where that data sits and what it's intended to help impact is going to be necessary. Um, and, and it would be great to start thinking through what that architecture, both uh, technically and organizationally should look like. I think that's all the questions at for for students in the webinar. Um, what would you say is academic preparation to, to serve them to contribute on issues in the real world? Um, I would say any any courses um, or conversations that are interdisciplinary will help practice um, how to start translating across some of these issues. It, so much of the challenge in this space is identifying when people are using the same language to mean different things or different language to mean the same things. The word bias alone, um, sitting in rooms with data scientists and with lawyers, I had to constantly um, call out when people were misunderstanding which concept was being called on when using the word bias. So exposure to different classes, different fields, um, different subjects can help give you, you don't have to be fluent in the other language. You just have to have an awareness of where there might be concerns uh, that that others will raise and have the ability to have a discourse around those. So practicing those conversations um, and thinking about the, the technologies outside of the four corners of the code um, and how, how they will be incorporated into other systems, how they will be, uh, impact, like how they will impact people, how they might impact society is, is really critical. One concerning thing I've seen in, in, uh, working with, um, engineers in general or, or product teams in general is, a, a a difficulty that they have even identifying what buckets of high level societal impact a system might relate to. Um, and that basic triaging, that basic categorization is going to be necessary to effectuate any sort of um, uh, best practices, rules, regulations around 
um, steps that need to be taken when machine learning is used in particular circumstances like credit. If the people building those systems um, don't describe their system clearly enough that either they or someone working with them, lawyers, um, you know, colleagues, et cetera, can identify that that system might implicate uh, uh, one of those those areas that is uh, higher sensitivity, um, then it will be much more difficult to make sure that these practices are actually adopted. And so practicing um, describing what system, what systems you're building or working on, what's their purpose, um, where might they plug in to other systems down the line and, and sort of um, stretch that imagination is, is going to be really important because, um, you know, there is a lot of technical work to be done, but that technical work is not happening in a silo. I think that's all the questions. Thank you so much, Miranda, for this wonderful talk and uh, for your insightful an answers. It was a pleasure hearing about your experiences. Thank you.